Hi, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm Jen Nelson. I'm sitting in for Sandy Mason tonight, and we have got a great panel of experts here to answer your gardening questions. So give us a call now, 217-333-3495, and we are ready and willing to take your questions. Uh, let's go ahead and introduce the panel. Uh, let them tell you a little bit about themselves, and we'll touch on some viewer emails as well. First, we have Chuck Voigt. Hi, Jennifer. Uh, I am Chuck Voigt, and <clears throat> I retired semi-recently from the Department of Crop Sciences here on the University of Illinois campus. Uh, my specialties were vegetables and herbs, but you know, I have some ability to talk about other things. Uh, <clears throat> tonight I have a frequently asked question, uh, and that would be, what's the best way to grow first prize county fair onions? You know, those giant globes of goodness. Well, I'm going to try to be brief, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, first of all, you, you decide uh, onion sets, onion plants, onion seeds. Uh, onion sets uh, grow really fast, and you make nice green onions from onion sets. But here's the thing about onion sets. The varieties that are used for onion sets are extremely pungent because pungency is related to keeping quality, and those growers want to be able to grow them the previous summer, keep them through the winter, sell them to you starting in March and April, and uh, so they're they're very pungent when you grow those. Also, if they're much bigger than three-eighths three of an inch in diameter, they tend to have a seed stalk come out of them. So uh, those are not good things because if a seed stalk comes out, it, it makes them odd-shaped, and it also gives an avenue for disease to come into them. So uh, my, my best bet would be uh, onion plants, and I've started to see bundles of those coming in. Uh, th they grow them in, in the south, Texas, Georgia, different places. Bundle them, ship them, ship them north. They're very, very, uh, they, they handle that really well. Um, and what you want to look for are uh, long day types. Uh, we need long day onions. Uh, the onion grows vegetatively until the, the day length gives it the cue to take the energy that it's formed and put it into a bulb. So if you have a long day onion, that happens later in the season. If you have a short day onion, that happens pretty early in the season. The short day onions are really designed for warm weather places where you sow them the previous fall. They grow through the winter and they harvest them maybe in April. Um, so that's not really a, a, a super bet for us. So we want to look for things with northern kinds of names, like Walla Walla Sweet okay. from Washington, uh, Red Weathersfield from Connecticut, uh, Sweet Spanish. If you look at a globe, strangely enough, Spain and, 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 and central Illinois are kind of at the same latitude. Um, you don't really want Texas 1015s or, or Bermudas or some of those things because they really try to bulb too early. If, if you're going to try those, you want to get them in probably in March so that they have a long season, and you know some seasons don't cooperate this one in being one of them. Um, <clears throat> so, and finally, do not ever pay a premium for plants or seeds labeled Vidalia onions. Vidalia is a growing area in Georgia that has low sulfur soils, and just like champagne can only be grown in certain areas of France, and burgundy can only be grown in a certain area of France, Vidalia onions can only be grown in that, I think it's a 15 <coughs> or 17 county area in central Georgia where the soils are low in sulfur. Sulfur makes up those, those pungency compounds. So you have a sweet onion, uh, you grow it in low sulfur conditions and you get a sweet onion. They don't keep worth, worth anything, but they're spectacularly sweet and, and non-pungent for the time that they exist. Thanks, Chuck. I learned a lot. I now know why I never liked the thousands of onion sets I had to plant as a kid. Um, they're a little pungent. Yeah, they're they're um, good if you cook them and, and kind of work on that pungency, but, but raw, they're, they're really potent. Oh, thank you. The, the, um, you were also the guest on the podcast last, so we want to remind um, our viewers to tune into the podcast for Mid-American Gardener, and you can download it on iTunes or Stitcher or NPR One, and so you can go in depth about all sorts of topics with our panelists. Uh, even more on onions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can finish. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, moving on. Yeah. Uh, Ella, what did you have for us? I'm Ella Maxwell. I work in a garden center in Peoria at Hare Nursery, at, so I can answer questions about trees and shrubs. I'm a horticulturist there, 
And uh, our, my question today was Kathy from Rushville. She submitted two pictures of her rose and she wants to know what it's called and how it could be trimmed. And its distinguishing factor are the thorns. It's very tall. And she started it from uh, one her grandmother had. So this is a rose called Harrison's Yellow. It's also known as the Oregon Trail Rose or the Yellow Rose of Texas. It uh, was discovered around the turn of the century and um, it is a single bloomer. It will just bloom in uh, early summer. So the best time to prune it would be to remove any dead this spring, but wait until after it's done blooming and then you could go ahead and trim it. And John's also going to tell us more about roses too. Um, I am John Bodensteiner and I'm a Vermaine County Master Gardener and I kind of like uh, perennials, trees, shrubs, uh, hostas especially, and tomatoes. Um, sliding right into what Ella was telling us, um, I have a question coming from Chuck, it's an email. Uh, I, he lives in Aurora and please tell me when I should uncover my roses. And then I have also one from Donna and I had my rose bush, bushes covered all winter. I, I recently uncovered it uh, with the recent warm weather and it looked dead. Uh, is it dead and if so, why? Well, if these were rose cones, um, you know, uh, the, 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 a chuck up in Aurora may have had some nights where he could have used the rose cone, but down here, we don't re recommend rose cones at all. Um, it just doesn't get cold enough in here. And then we have all those warm periods, which is even worse for the roses because if it gets really warm in those rose cones, what happens, it breaks the dormancy. And <clears throat> pretty soon there are gonna be little shoots coming out the side. And then when it gets cold, those shoots make the, the uh, rose uh, uh, vulnerable to frost and freezing. And then once those shoots freeze and die, the whole plant can dehydrate and, and they die very quickly. Um, the um, way to tell whether you should cover is you wait till there's a killing frost and all the leaves have fallen off your rose. Then you clean up around your rose. Don't leave those leaves around because that's just a, a good chance for uh, you to harbor disease there. Uh, and then the best way to kind of is to mound up the soil, loose soil, a mulch around the plant. Uh, if you are going to use a rose cone, uh, cut four or five holes in the top, put a brick on it so it doesn't blow away because that's another thing they, they tend to do is blow away. Um, <clears throat> and for the more tender roses, there are certain roses that will tell you that they are tender take that top completely off and stuff it with straw or, or a good dried leaves, something to really pack it in there. And um, climbing roses, you may have to lay those down, dig up one side, just lay them down and cover up, up that. Uh, select a rose that is hardy in your area. Make sure that before you start having to do all this that you've selected a good rose. Um, and, yeah. and that, that's, I think, those are, are some of the things. Uh, whether your rows are dead, I wouldn't do anything until we've had a few more days. If you see no growth uh, come the first of, or middle of May, probably if our weather holds, it is probably dead. A good way to tell is if you have coloration on the bottom mm -hmm. where there's green, you may get some shoots. If it's a uh, grafted rose, if it comes below that, that little knob, you're going to go back and you don't want that rose anyway. Right. Uh, it's, um, it's going to It'll refer the to root the root stock. Root stock. And uh, so... Um, it's a little too soon to tell because yeah. we, the weather just can't seem to decide. I did notice some of my roses, some of the, you know, I didn't cover anything. And I do notice a, a few swelling buds on them, so... Okay, okay. All right, we're going to go into our callers. We have some uh, folks waiting to ask. Um, us their questions. Line two, Patty from Springfield has a question on her daffodils. Hi, Patty. Hi. Um, I got the stems that came up, and that was it. My first question would be last year when after they were done blooming, uh, did you cut? Did you leave the right. the greens turn yellow and and go to go into dormancy? 
Uh, no. Yeah. I cut them. Okay, and that's and that's that's probably the main reason we we don't get reblooming uh, daffodils is that we cut that green off. The plant doesn't get a chance. It's put all its energy into blooming, and producing a seed, and then you cut them off and. Uh, then they don't have a chance to revitalize that bulb. And right now they're just trying to recuperate. Mm -hmm. They won't bloom this year. They're gonna try to rejuvenate that bulb uh, strength uh, for next year. So uh, wait, wait, if you can, let the, um, the, the leaves yellow or start to yellow. Once they start to yellow, then you can trim them because they're not gonna be putting any more nutrients into the soil. But uh, if, if they really look ugly, cut them at, a, at an angle, make them look, uh, uh, braid them. Yeah. Braid yeah. People braid yeah. them. Yeah. I think it's easiest just to wrap them with rubber bands. Yeah. You don't yeah. have to braid them. We've had um, okay. we've had trouble with the ones at our house. They um, just seem to stay green for so long, and yeah. we've had it coming up on Fourth of July, and we still have green uh, daffodils. So I read somewhere that as long as they've been going for at least six weeks after they've bloomed, it's safe. There you <laughs> go. So <laughs> whack them back. Okay. Then. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank a lot, you. Patty. Okay, let's go to line three. <clears throat> Steve in Bloomington has an Azalea question. Thank you for taking my call. I really enjoy your show. Oh, thank you. Um, I've had an Azalea. I think it's a Stewartsonian, which is red. And it's been in the ground for about three years, and it will not bloom. It's healthy. The leaves come out. I was wondering what you all think might be the problem. Well, with uh, that Stewartsonian ro uh, rhododendron azalea, they're in the same family, the buds are formed the following or the previous fall to bloom in the spring. So if you're doing any fall pruning, potentially you could be cutting off the flowers for the following year. Uh, also, if they're in too shaded of an area, they might not be able to make flowering um, buds for that following year. So fertilizing might be helpful, having the right acidity with the mm -hmm. soil. Any other ideas? I would say the acidity. I've yeah. had trouble with them because of the acidity. You're just fighting it in central Illinois. We just tend to have too alkaline of soil. So maybe those are some of the things that you can try. Don't prune, fertilize, uh, adjust the soil's acidity so that you get a healthy plant as well. And um, you could try wilt proof over the winter. Maybe mm -hmm. there are buds there, but they just freeze and you could give them a little extra protection. Okay, all great answers, so lots of things to try. I <coughs> uh, hope that's found that helpful. We're gonna go to our next caller, uh, line four, Catherine from Charleston. She has a question on reusing bulbs. Hi, yes, Catherine. I have a tulip plant, an indoor tulip plant, which I got from Walmart. Mm -hmm. The leaves are, are yellow, the flowers have died, and I'm wondering if I can plant the um, bulbs outside. Will they be? Will they be viable? Oh, definitely. Absolutely. It would be viable. The question is, in a pot, if they if they stored enough energy to bloom again, that would be not this year. Th yeah. Well, not, or not yeah. next year, probably. Yeah, probably not either. next year either. Yeah. Well, and then and then tulips have a tendency to go down downhill over time. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, tulips are not as, as as good a bet from a potted plant as are like daffodils right. and some of the other things which which uh, seem to go through forcing and, and, and then turn out uh, quite well. Tulips are, are a little iffier. Will they live? Yes. Will they rebloom? Maybe eventually. Mm -hmm. You've got it. Might as well plant it out and see what yeah, happens. You have nothing to lose other than having to pull right. them out and get it, getting that leaf to stop coming up year after year after year that you don't want. Right. So it sounds like you've got a fun project on your hands. <laughs> so uh, let's go to our next caller. Uh, Liz from Armington has a question on tomato starts. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. What's your no, question? Okay. Um, I, I start tomato plants and uh, put them under grow lights in uh, a closed-in porch. It gets about 60 degrees all the time. Um, they get uh, about 14 hours of light. And I have uh, run a fan sometimes a couple of hours maybe on the floor give them a little draft, I thought, mm -hmm. to harden them out. But I know some of them are getting um, uh, yellowed on the leaf tips and kind of mottled and they're wilty. 
and I'm wondering if it's from the draft or do I maybe have an insect problem that I would need to spray for. If they're getting, if it, they're getting to the point where they're getting fairly large, it might just be that your soil has run out of being mm -hmm. you're watering it, and you're leach, you may have leached out all the nutrients in the soil, and mm -hmm. you may just have to give it a very mild shot of of uh, 10, 10, 10, or or one of those. Don't don't give it a um, a grass fertilizer where it's all nitrogen. You want something with more of the phosphorus and the potash, and just a little bit of nitrogen, mm -hmm. and uh, then the micronutrients also. But I would bet that it's and and uh, it's probably the the um, the um, just the washing out, the leaching out of of the soil, and uh, it might be that uh, it just needs a, a little shot in the arm, and it should come right back. I like that you're putting a little air uh, a fan on that, you know, as it vibrates. That back and forth that makes that stock much much stronger, so that when you do take it out to the to the um, uh, outside, uh, it's not going to snap off like some right. of the the plants do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a ni that's a nice touch, but um, I agree. I would put some fertilizer on them. You still got a while before mm -hmm. those end up getting outside. Yeah, I usually put mine out June first. So yeah. Unless the soil is really warm, 70 degrees. That's about when I'll get mine out, I'm sure. Okay, let's uh, take another question. Deb from Muhammad. She has a question on uh, raised beds and the soil. Hi, Deb. Hi. Yeah, I'm making an outdoor raised vegetable garden that's 8 by 12 feet. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what kind of soil to put in it. I found somebody that would deliver pumpkin compost. Just wondering if that would be good or if I should put something else in there. Oh, that's a that's a loaded question. There's so many different things we could use in a raised in a raised bed. Uh, what would you guys suggest? What comes to mind first? Well, definitely, if you are going to have some soil delivered, regardless of what it is, you can then do a soil test mm -hmm. because without the soil test, you don't really know what you really need to add because that pumpkin compost is going to be high in organic matter and it could be used as a potting or as a planting soil but you might need something more so chuck yeah you might want to uh double dig if your soil is any good at all mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. get get some good compost and double dig that into mm -hmm. the <clears throat> to the existing mineral soil and and that should fluff it up enough get the so better that, texture so, so that you get better texture and you've got the the organic matter distributed through it and, but you've also got uh, some of that mineral content that's going to hang on to nutrients well, and and and, and you don't uh, have that hard pan, right? Uh, type, right? That's actually what we did at our house. We used mixed compost with the native soil, mm -hmm. and it worked really well. It, mm -hmm. it yeah. you get the good organics from the compost, but you do want that texture, mm -hmm. um, so that when it rains and you don't just have muck. So yep. That. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, we're going to go ahead and do another round of emails, <coughs> and if anyone wants to give us a call, we'll try to fit a couple questions in, too. Okay. It seems like it's allium night for me. Oh, okay. Uh, this uh, Sonia said, wanted to know, when is the best time to plant garlic, spring or fall? I've been told that different varieties are planted at different times. It's my first time planting garlic. Uh, and then she asks about, is it a good companion plant? <coughs> well, uh, the prime time, as far as I can see, to plant garlic in in Mid America, is probably October first to fifteenth. Uh, you want it to be maybe six weeks before the soil starts to freeze, and obviously that can change by six <laughs> or eight weeks each year. But uh, October first to fifteenth has worked pretty well for me. I've gotten by planting it later than that. Um, if you plant much earlier than that, it tends to get a lot of top growth on it, which makes me a little nervous. Um, <clears throat> Fall planted garlic uh, outperformed spring planted garlic mm -hmm. by a wide margin. Uh, when I was a young 4 H gardener, uh, I would order garlic from a, a mail order catalog. It would come in the spring, I would plant it, and I'd get these little <laughs> piddly little rounds of garlic, and it was very discouraging. And then uh, later on, I got uh, some bulbs from my brother in law, uh, broke those up, planted them in the fall, and it was like, it was like night and day in terms of how it happened. So, um, if you're looking to start some now and can find seed garlic because the catalogs and everywhere has gotten much better, mm -hmm. they, they'll take your order now, but they won't ship it until September, which is a good thing generally. But if you want to have some in the garden now and you can find seed garlic, that would be, that would be excellent. Um, what you don't want to do is probably get some from the, the grocery store because there's, there's not a lot of 
of checking on what they, they sell for food in terms of some, some pretty major and nasty uh, garlic diseases. Um, so uh, if you can wait till fall or, or summer, uh, go online. There's some great, uh, great organic gardening, uh, uh, organic garlic places. Uh, get your order in because some, they sell a lot of popular varieties sometimes. But get seed garlic from a, from a rep, reputable source. Uh, plant it in, in nice, rich soil, 1st to the 15th of October. Mm -hmm. uh, the only other thing is it, you talk about sometimes we plant uh, elephant garlic in the spring. Uh, elephant garlic is really a big-headed leek and not really a garlic. So... Um, that, that you could plant in the spring and still do okay. Uh, it, it doesn't always make it through the winter, particularly in the northern okay. half of mid-America. Well, thanks, Chuck. Lots of good information there. <clears throat> Ellen? All right. Um, my question was on dusty peonies. Uh, Midsummer last year, her peonies became dusty in appearance. How should I treat it if it returns? Uh, most likely this is a uh, powdery mildew. It's a fungal disease. And uh, the best thing to do is in the fall, remove that infected foliage so that it can't reinfect the following spring, have the plants mulched. Um, it's really cosmetic in nature, uh, probably doesn't do a lot, but there are some sprays that you could wait to apply until you see that it's beginning to form. Um, and uh, just enjoy those beautiful peonies. Thanks, Ella. John, did you have another email? Yes, I do. I have, uh, actually, I have a, a voicemail. Ah. So this is a little different. We get, we're starting to get voicemails. Yeah. Uh, this um, uh, is a question about Francis William hostas, which is one of my favorite hostas, too. Uh, and, and she has them planted around her maple tree. And she's done this for many years. And they were quite big and beautiful. And now they seem to not come back or not near as big. Uh, just wondering what I should do. Am I planting too close to the tree? Uh, is there a particular lifespan for Francis Williams? And uh, any, you know, she's just wanting. The first thing I saw was maple tree, under planting them under the maple mm -hmm. tree. A maple tree are shallow rooted. Um, if you got them to be large and, and big, um, that was a bonus uh, with the summers we're having where it's dry, then it's wet, then it's dry. When it's wet, uh, they probably are, are sharing the moisture with the maples. When it's dry, the maples are not going to give the, the hostas the, the right. time of day. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> um, the, the, they do not have a lifespan as far as, as getting to a certain age and then um, and then dying, um, I would I would try to plant them in a shaded area, um, but not where they're 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 in competition with something as major as a maple tree. And uh, you might, if you, if you can, if it's a huge maple tree, uh, take them out to the very edge of the drip and plant them out there. Uh, they're not going to get as much shade, so I would find another. I would just find them another place and get away yeah. from the maple tree. Um, you know, John, another thing that I've found in my garden that wanes with that might be vole damage. Oh, yeah. And oh, that yeah. would be a, a little rodent that lives through the winter that can feed on the crown of the plant. So you want to check that because uh, if you had been doing well before. Um, and then also, like John said, that root competition, double check to make sure that you you don't see maple roots in that area, but uh, you might want to divide them, move them to another spot, regrow them. Mm -hmm. All great suggestions, you guys. I've been fighting a tree at home with, in terms of with other plants and they do what, like their moisture. Mm -hmm. But this is a great opportunity to point out that if you didn't get through tonight, uh, fear not, you can call our voicemail line and we'll take your question at any time and use it in a podcast, use it in a show. Give us a call at 217-300-8224, and uh, we will be happy to take your question and, and use it later on. So when you wake up at night and you have that burning question at 2 in the morning, you can call. <laughs> We've had a gr great show tonight and great group of uh, panelists, and this has just uh, um, been a fun evening. And I want to point out that tonight we're saying goodbye to our show's longtime production manager, Jeff Cunningham, and we are going to miss him so much. 
Uh, he's always been a really fun addition to the crew and he has worked here at WILL in some capacity for 30 years and he's been with Mid-American Gardener for 10 years. And he told me last week that working on Mid-American Gardener is really one of the highlights of his week and he loves doing the live production and we love having him and we're we're wishing him luck for his future endeavors. Hopefully there's a lot of uh, relaxation and uh, rest in his retirement and, and uh, we gardening. wish him luck. And gardening, yes. yes. He's learned a lot over 10 years Yes, with us. you can tell that he really enjoys the subject. It comes through when he yeah. comes and talks can, with us. He can voicemail us a question if he has something. Exactly, <laughs> he's got the inside yeah. track for all of that. So uh, He's gonna come pick up some firewood up at, up at my farm up north, so. There you go. But we're gonna keep him busy. There, oh good. <coughs> So this has been a great evening. Hope you all can get out in the garden this weekend and do something. Check if your roses are alive or dead. Uh, maybe plant some onions, plant some. Spring is here, I think. Spring is here, I hope, I hope. <laughs> For at least another day. <laughs> <laughs> at least another day and then we'll have some freezing again. Uh, but just get out in the garden anyway, uh, no matter what the weather and sooner or later we'll have uh, some nice weather for gardening. Thanks a lot, everyone. And thanks for uh, watching.